throne of God, covered in his righteousness.
with other believers napping in the afternoon. These things make the Lord's Day, our Sabbath day, one of worship and rest. So the question is, do you look forward to Sundays or you wish they could be labeled a second Saturday? <laughs> And I, I pray that the Lord's Day is viewed as a delight instead of a burden in your life. It's, it's a lifeline for me to be with you all on Sundays. The major theme of Psalm 92 is the sovereign rule of God. It's stated in verse 8, and we'll get to this in a moment, which is that central verse of the psalm. And it proclaims that God is most high. He is on high, that he, one version of the night, he says, is exalted forevermore. The covenant name, Yahweh, is, is used seven times. Elion, which is most high, is found in verse 1, and Elohim is found in verse 13. And because our God reigns supremely and always will, we can be the people of God that he wants us to be. This psalm describes the characteristics of believers who trust in this sovereign God. So let's dive in this morning and see what the psalmist declares. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, Eliot, O, o Most High. To declare your hesed, your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your thoughts, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know. The fool cannot understand this. That though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. Here's a central theme. Verse 8, but you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered, but you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox and have poured over me fresh Oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, and my ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow in the cedar, like a cedar in Lebanon. They are playing in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age, and they are ever full of sap, green. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. What a great passage. God's word is great and greatly to be praised. Because it is good to give thanks to the Lord. In verses 1 to 5. Because of who he is. And what he has done. We're going to give three reasons. And this is number one that the psalmist gives in the first five verses. Let's go back and reiterate what we just saw in verses one to five. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. And your faithfulness to God by night. To the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The psalmist is saying that we should be a worshiping people in light of who he is and what he has done. That should be our response. Part of Israel's covenant relationship with the Lord was their honoring of the weekly Sabbath. It was a special sign between Israel and the Lord, and it reminded them that God had delivered them from Egypt. But the Sabbath also reminded them of God, their creator, Elohim, and the covenant of God. Seven times in Genesis 1 that we are told that what God made was good. 
The psalmist now adds an eighth good thing. And it's good to give thanks and praise to the Lord. Believers they can praise the Lord for his generous creation gifts. For his salvation through the blood of the Lamb. And for his gracious covenant with us because of what Jesus did on the cross. We ought to worship as a natural overflow of our heart that's loving the Lord and appreciates of who he is and what he has done. Why? Because it's fitting to praise the Lord. Psalm 147 says, praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God for it is pleasant. And a song of praise is fitting. It's appropriate. It should be natural. The introduction of this psalm lays the groundwork for the main idea that it is good and fitting to praise God. And to praise God should be a delight and not just a burdensome duty. And the rest of the psalm will flesh out why it's true. But let's go to verse 1 and unpack these verses. The very first thing he says, it is good to give thanks to the Lord. The psalmist begins with a simple and profound statement. He is saying to give thanks to Yahweh, the covenant God of, of Israel and the maker of heaven and earth. I am who I am. He's always been here in existence and he created us. It's good to give thanks. And then in the second part, he says to sing praises to the name of the Most High. In Hebrew poetry, there's often a use of parallelism, and it's used here with similar words. This is an example of this in the first part of verse 1 and the second half, with the second phrase, in essence, repeating the essential idea of the first. And so the psalmist is saying to sing praise to God, and his name is very much like giving thanks to the Lord. They're Singing is a valid and wonderful expression of gratitude to God. It just kind of fits like a glove. It goes hand in hand. Then it goes on to verse 2 to declare the steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. God's loving kindness, his covenant loyal love and faithfulness is another way of giving thanks. This declaration is not only to be made on our good days and good nights, but every night. And haven't you tasted and seen the goodness when we're praising him of his love through tears and through pain? Morning and evening we press on because praise unlocks and loosens the chains of our discouragement and pain. Verse 3, then he goes into this musical expression. It says, for the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre, worship and honor to God may be expressed in music with a variety of instruments, even a bass guitar, even trumpets and all that good stuff. You know? the, the first three verses of this psalm shows that worshiping and honoring God have many different aspects and expressions. And we should worship God in any available and honoring way. Think about this. It could be in thanksgiving and singing and declaration of his word. It may be because of who he is, the Lord Most High, the highly exalted one, or it could be because of what he has done in his loving kindness and in his faithfulness. Doesn't that ring of Lamentations 3, great is your faithfulness? Hmm. It may be because it can be done at day or at night. There's not a set time to praise him. He's here all time. And then it may be done with singing and with instrumental music. These first three verses are sharing the importance of praise, thanksgiving, with all of our being, with instruments and with our voices. And then he goes on to verse 4 and 5. says, For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and at the works of your hands I sing for joy. Do you ever look at God's creation and what he has done and be filled with joy? Or is it like, yeah, it's a nice sunset. Got up in the morning, but so feet still firm. Yeah, God. And you fix that too, but what about the sun and the, and the goodness of getting this out? Singing. He says, How great are your works? Verse 5, your thoughts are very deep. 
The opening of the psalm reveals the heart of a man who knows God and is eager to praise him. Eager. And as others who know God and who have been given eyes to see his character and his works. We should be a people of praise both personally, privately, and also corporately as a gathered people. Warren Wearsby writes, whether we use voices alone or voices accompanied by instruments, we can express our praises to God and focus on his wonderful attributes. We can worship all day long from morning to evening. We can begin the day assured of his love and end the day looking back on his faithfulness. We can look around and marvel at his works, including his providential care and leading in our own lives. And we can look into his word and probe the depths of his great thoughts. And whether we are stirred by the creation around us or the scriptures before us, we have every reason to worship and praise God for he is reigning above us. Remember verse 8, he is highly exalted forever. Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Paul, in thinking about this at the end of, of Romans, he goes into this great doxology to say, oh, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. We worship him and give thanks to him because of who he is and what he has done. And then we move into verses 6 through 11. And the psalmist says we give thanks to him because he and he alone will triumph over the wicked. He will triumph over the wicked. We serve a victorious, living, powerful, almighty, most high God, the stupid man. The psalmist writes in verse 6, cannot know, the fool cannot understand this, that though the wicked sprout like grass and all evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies have shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. But you, in contrast, have exalted my horn. Like that of the wild ox, and you have exalted and poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, and my ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. When we compare the flourishing wicked, but when we know their end, we should be an overcoming people. Stupid man, the senseless man cannot know, the fool cannot understand, but the wicked will sprout like grass and they will ultimately be doomed to destruction forever. While the psalmist sees God rightly, he makes it clear that there are some who are without understanding. They are fools in regard to God and as a result they reject him. This brutish or senseless or stupid man never attempts to see God in his works. Can you think of people like that? They never attempt to see God and his works around them. They're dull, they're senseless, they're brutish. But oh, for us who have had their eyes enlightened by the Spirit, we see and we know his great works. Here in verses 6 through 11, that the psalmist shifts our attention to the enemies of the Lord who make life difficult for God's people. The King James Version calls them brutish, which means beastly or lacking values and discernment. They're savage. They're only living to satisfy their own appetite. Their God is their stomach, so to speak. Other translations use stupid, senseless, rude, uncultivated. These are adjectives gone 
tells me all the time about me. But um, I just, there's grace, there's grace. The fool in, in Psalm 14 would qualify this. Remember, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable things and deeds, and there is none who does good. Isaiah 49 declares, man in his pomp, in his pomp yet without understanding, is, is like the beasts that perish. Oh, God, give us humility to know where we fit from your sovereign hand to our finite being. Psalm 94, the psalmist traces this, almost a parallel like the angst of Psalm 92. He writes, O oh Lord, God of vengeance, O oh God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O oh judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. O oh Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exalt? They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O oh Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, our God does not see. The God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O dullest of the people. Fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, and they are but a breath. These brutish people are like grass. They have no deep roots, and so all they, although there's luxurious growth, it will pass quickly. You, you've seen that with our lawn. You, you have about five, six days of no water, and what happens? They are dried up. But God's faithful people, they're like palm trees and cedars. We'll find out in this next section. James Montgomery Boyce, though, suggested a connection with this passage of Psalm 92 to Psalm 8. If you remember Psalm 8, he declares that what is man, you are mindful of him. By calling mankind, he says, a little lower than the heavenly beings, rather than a little higher than the beasts. It indicates that it is man's calling to look up to God and become like God. And whose image he is made. But if we will not look up, the only place is to be able to look down. And he will begin to behave like an animal. Hmm. Are we looking up to God and living in his image? Or are we looking down to the depraved creatures that are acting brutishly, beastly, foolish, senseless? While the wicked may enjoy a measure of happiness and success in this life, their end is destruction, and all those who oppose God will be punished forever. Listen, we must fight the temptation for comparison and envy with the wicked who flourish in this life on earth. Trust in the goodness and trust in the grace and justice of our Creator God. Rest in His character. Trust in His promises and be thankful for His new morning mercies that are new every morning. Verse 8, again, the central theme says, You, O Lord, are on high forever. Here the psalmist contrasts the eternal punishment of the wicked with the eternal reign of God. It's a subtle reminder again. This is another reason to exalt and praise the Lord. While many may oppose God now, in the end, he will be vindicated and rule over all. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And as he goes on in verse 10, the psalmist says that you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox and you have poured over me fresh oil. Now the, the horn was a symbol of, of strength and might and power. The wicked are destroyed, but the righteous have their strength exalted. God gives his people power to overcome their foes. We can be victorious. The, the image of the horn also invokes this metaphor of oil, as oil was poured from a horn. If you remember in 1 Samuel 16, when David was anointed, it says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. 
And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him from that day forward. Oil is, was used to anoint special people. Think of those dignitaries of, of priests and kings and prophets. But here we have this anonymous psalmist of Psalm 92 rejoicing because the Lord had anointed him with fresh oil. The anointing with fresh oil brought refreshment and honor and blessing and power and enablement of God being poured out into his life. Have you received that lately? Have been refreshed by God? Been poured out with new strength and new mercy? In verse 11, the psalmist says, My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, and my ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. God wants his people to be overcomers. And this comes first when we are worshipers, right? We must be a worshiping people before we can really become an overcoming people. Think of these passages on the list of how God wants us to prevail and overcome and persevere and conquer. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Be an overcomer. John in 1 John 4 says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is greater in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. For everyone, the next chapter John writes, who has been born of God? overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. See the difference. The brutish take no account for God, but those through faith that acknowledge Him and have seen His glory have victory. Who is this that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, to the one who does not give up, who perseveres to the end, to the one who conquers. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, eaten, restored. The one who conquers and overcomes will be clothed us in white garments. It's not our garments. It's Christ's. Righteous garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. We have the high priest confessing our name as our advocate. And our names will not be blot out from the book of life. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. Hallelujah. We are called to be an overcoming, conquering, enduring, persevering people, relying on God's grace through the power of the Spirit to be victorious when He comes for His own. And as the people of God, we may be tempted to look at the apparent prosperity of the wicked with envy or frustration. Why do I get that? Well, Facebook ticks me off because I, I, I fight this. Look at all these other people and they're all what they're doing and how good they look and where they're at. Why do I get you? You start... You start pouting, comparing, and envy. Stop it. <laughs> Here's a reminder of what is to come. The wicked will not stand, and God will reign forever. We shall overcome. Oh, it is good to give thanks to the Lord lastly, because he causes the righteous to flourish. Verses 12 through 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. Amen, Roger. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in Him. We should be this flourishing people. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord and they flourish in the courts of God. This, the senseless, brutish crowd is like grass. They will fade away, but the righteous are like trees. The wicked may look sturdy, but they don't last. Pastor David Guzik 
comments, the wicked should understand that this world provides the best they will ever experience. And the righteous should know that this world provides the worst they will ever experience. Think about that. When we're comparing and then being and having our own pity parties and feeling down, this world is all they've got. But for us that are in Christ, who have placed their faith and their hope in this covenant-keeping God, the best is yet to come. Amen? Sure does spit the face of smiling Joel. Have your best life now. If you want your best life now here, boy, you are just being shortchanged to the immense degree. I want heaven's benefits. Psalmist writes in Psalm 37, I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. I saw him out, but I could not find him. Now let's compare Psalm 52. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in his abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction? That's folly. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. Not me. God has done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. The, this word flourish, when speaking of evildoers in verse 7, means to be conspicuous or to shine, while the word in verses 12 and 13, and while speaking of the righteous, means to be vigorous, to be flourishing richly. This stately date palm and cedar were highly valued by people in the Near East. And the palm for its fruit and the cedar for its wood both were appreciated for their beauty, and both trees can survive for many years. I love the imagery the psalmist gives, and I love what Spurgeon says about it. When we see a noble palm standing erect, sending all its strength upward in one bold column, and growing amid the dirt and drought of the desert, we have a fine picture of the godly man, who in his uprightness aims alone to the glory of God, and independent of outward circumstances, and independent of outward circumstances, is made to, by divine grace, to live and thrive where all things else perish. If he is your rock, you can flourish. Verse 14, they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and greed, and declaring the Lord is upright. They ran and writes in our daily bread. <laughs> A familiar saying goes something like this. Old age is a matter of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Well, that's pretty cliche, but sometimes it still catches up and bites us, right? But that must have been John Kelly's attitude. Kelly, who died in 2004 at the age of 96, ran in 58 Boston marathons. Okay, that's 26.2 miles each time. Like, does he have a car? I mean, come on. But including his last one in 92, when he was 84 years old. Kelly's remarkable feat is a reminder to each of us that we must stay active as long as we can. Far too many folks hit middle age and put the body in neutral. And Christians, too, often put their service for Jesus Christ in the same inactive mode. But each of us has a responsibility to God as long as he gives us physical and mental strength to work heartily as to the Lord. We are never called to retire from life and just coast home to heaven. The psalmist said that the righteous shall still bear fruit in old age. And for those who are physically able, that means continuing in active service. For those who can no longer move about, this means being active in prayer and in quiet service. So let's make sure old age does not stop us from bearing fruit. We need to keep going for God. Mm. Now, not all... 
godly people live long. I think of Robert Murray McChain, who was a pastor in Dundee, Scotland, and David Rayner, who was an American missionary to the Native Americans. They died very young at the age of 29. But in their 29 years, they had such a huge impact for the glory of God and for the salvation of souls. But generally speaking, those who obey God avoid a great deal of the danger and disease that can cause an early death. And we think of the promise of Psalm 91.6 that says, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's still true. And so this is a picture we see in verses 12 through 14. To stay fresh and green in old age and not spend one's life complaining and demanding is a mark of God's special blessing. It's a mark of maturity. We change as we grow older, but the Lord never changes. He is our rock, and what he wills for us is perfect. So we will not complain. I love it as people age when they get more gracious and humble and servant -like. Oh, when you do, that is the sign of God's work in your life. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away our inner self is being renewed day by day so our arthritis and wrinkles and joint replacements that's going to happen but inside we can be refreshed and renewed and this is the, the confident proven experience of the psalmist he says he is my rock verse 15 and there is no unrighteousness in him he knew from both understanding and life experience that god could be trusted and did all things in goodness he had that relationship and as we live in this world, it can be so easy to think and do things and see things with a very narrow lens. Some are so often to lose hope or to lack passion for God. But this psalm should serve us as a source of clarity. It's a reminder of who God is and what he has done with the hope of those who know him. And we have been given sight through the Holy Spirit to see God rightly. We know that in the end, he will reign and this clarity should bring praise and thanksgiving. When British pastor and writer John Scott turned 80, a friend penned a tribute to him that highlighted his discipline of prayer. For decades, Scott had begun each day with a prayer like this. Good morning, Heavenly Father. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Then he goes on to worship each member of the Trinity individually, acknowledging and praising them for the work in the lives of believers. Then he continues, Father, I pray that I may live this day in your presence and please you more and more. Lord Jesus, I pray that this day I may take up my cross and follow you. Holy Spirit, I pray this day you will fill me with yourself and cause your fruit to ripen in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity. Three persons in one God. Have mercy upon me. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord because of who he is and what he has done. Because he will triumph over the wicked and because he causes the righteous to flourish. So let's be a worshiping people. Let's be an overcoming people. Let's be a flourishing people. All for the glory of God. Amen. Father, help us to live out this song with this clarity, this song for the Sabbath as we come to you and, and gather together that we focus just on the awesome truth of who you are and what you've done to save us. We know our end and we know you are sovereign over all things. So give us a heart that is in tune and in step with your spirit so we can be a flourishing, fruitful member of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, Lord, my rock and my